Hello and welcome. I'm Maya, your facilitator for today's workshop on community-led innovation using the design sprint method. I'm also the founder of the Shifting Power Accelerator, an experiential cohort-based course run over four live workshops to help global nonprofit professionals take action on local leadership, equal partnerships, and direct funding. I'm Pakistani and a neurodivergent non-binary woman. I'm wearing a black dress, gold-rimmed metal glasses, and have dark medium-length hair. I'm joining from my home in beautiful Puerto Rico. And if you haven't already, please introduce yourselves in the chat. Let me know where you're joining from. And while you're doing that, I'd like to give a special shout out to Kenny, my behind the scenes co-facilitator for the workshop today. Kenny is the founder of Why Here Matters, a community building consultancy that liaises between organizations, initiatives, and local communities to engage and support people towards advancing mutually beneficial collaborative outcomes. Kenny uses he, him pronouns. So now here's a bonus question to keep things playful as we move into the workshop. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? As you type away in the chat, I'll take the opportunity to share a few reminders. First, this event is being recorded for our friends who aren't able to join us live. And as such, and to make the webinar more accessible, we will occasionally read and share comments from the chat. If you need captions, please click on the button below that says CC or live transcript. And because we had almost 150 people signing up, we are using Zoom webinar mode. This means video and audio are turned off for participants, but we highly encourage you to interact with us and each other using the chat. To keep things organized, please put your questions in the Q&A box so we don't lose them. Otherwise, have fun in the chat. It also keeps me motivated too. Speaking of which, I'm seeing some interesting ice cream flavors coming up. Brian, mint chocolate chip is actually my favorite as well, although I know that's a controversial choice. Snipperdoodle, I'm hearing vanilla, classic. So thanks for sharing. With that, let's get started. I've been looking forward to covering this topic of community-led innovation. And it's because it marries the two things that I think about and care about the most participatory and community-led approaches on the one hand, and creativity and innovation on the other. So for me, community participation and local leadership is not just about what's right, but it's also about what's effective. And creativity and innovation are not just about what's effective, it's also about what's fun and inclusive. So this is really exciting for me. Please drop a yes, see, we, a, wa in the chat to let me know if you agree. And a small sidebar, please don't forget to check your settings in the chat so that your messages are going to everyone and not just the hosts and panelists. We also want you to feel comfortable chatting in the language that you know, so we promise to respond and engage with you as best as we can. Great. I'm seeing some... A new arrival, Claude joining from Nigeria. I'm hearing yeses, saying yeses, SESC. Great. It's pretty clear this topic is exciting, but it's also necessary, and I'm glad you agree. In particular, I'm glad because it means I can skip the why about community-led innovation, why it's important, and we can move straight to the barriers that we need to overcome and how we can support this process using tools and resources that are available to us. I'm going to start with the real counter pressures and challenges that have so far made it difficult for community-led innovation to be the norm in our sector. And as a longtime researcher, designer, and nonprofit consultant working for and with international NGOs and civil society organizations, I'm very familiar with institutional barriers and emotional pushback from all directions. When I was starting out, all I wanted to do was to support the shifting of power in our sector as it was our mandate. And yet most of what I saw was a lot of talk and little action on changing the way that we worked. It was frustrating. I was told we've always done it this way, which was a form of institutional pushback or what will the donors say? 
which felt more like a fear of being punished for doing the wrong thing. So please drop a yes, see we, awa in the chat to let me know if you've heard these lines before and if this is resonating. Great, I'm seeing the yeses coming in. I mean, it's not great, it's heartbreaking actually, but at least you know that you're not alone. It's also true and sad that sometimes this pushback is so much that we begin to internalize it too. And that's what happened to me for a while. But that nagging feeling didn't go away, right? And it doesn't go away, I'm sure, for you either. So it wasn't long before I began looking elsewhere to prove the detractors wrong. I did my own research, found and connected with more advocates and change makers in the sector. And once I became a consultant, I had the privilege of working with teams who had already bought into the approaches and methods I was hoping to see more of in the sector. And once I started down this path, I realized the limiting beliefs that kept most of my colleagues from embracing new and different ways of working. And it surprised me. So I'd like to share this discovery with you. I call this discovery the three myths or limiting beliefs about donor funding and project design. Myth one, donors don't allow community partners to be the lead decision makers for programming. In other words, donors distrust local and community partners and would only allow an international NGO to lead on project design and decision making. The reality? The reality is that community-led project design is actually a priority for most donors, and they're actively seeking partnerships that prioritize it. For example, USAID has an agency priority of increasing co-creation in all new awards by 5%. If you know about examples from other donors, this would actually be a great time to drop your knowledge bombs in the chat. So let us know if you've worked with other donors, you heard this myth before and what you found out the reality actually is. Myth number two, donors require submission of a concept note and a proposal from an imp implementing partner before any kind of community-led process can occur. And the reality, community-led processes can start at any time, including before a concept note or proposal is even put together. For example, USAID policy is that it's better if the co-creation process begins as early as possible. Myth number three, donors require international NGOs to have internal capacity in design thinking and human-centered design before they even consider a community-led innovation project. And the reality, co-design implies that everyone has some form of expertise that they bring to the table. That may be technical expertise from an INGO, local expertise from a community partner, and design and innovation expertise from an external facilitator. In fact, USAID actively encourages the engagement of skilled independent facilitators so that all voices can be heard, community voices can be centered, and that the process stays on track. So was this surprising? Does this resonate? Which one of these myths was most surprising or the reality? Have you heard any of these before? Let me know in the chat. It would be really helpful to hear. And if you have any other myths or limiting beliefs that I've missed, please do share. I would love to hear your thoughts. Let's move on to where we can go from here. If we choose to discard these myths and embrace the truth, what does that mean in terms of pushing community-led innovation forward? And before we jump into the practical approach you can all use, let's take a step back and make sure that we're all on the same page with our definition of community-led innovation. Here we have the community-led continuum. And let's say there are four kinds of approaches to working with communities. We have at the starting point, which tends to be more of the norm or the traditional way of working in global aid and development, which says that the community is informed or consulted on project design. And that tends to be donor-led, INGO-led. And then we have on the other far side of the spectrum, when a community completely owns a project and the project design. 
And here we call it community led. So in this continuum on this spectrum, you go from a project design being informed by the community, a project design being shaped by the community, a project design being driven by the community, and finally a project design being completely owned by the community. So really it's in the middle space in which projects and are designed and shaped by communities or driven by communities that I'm going to talk about in terms of community-led innovation, because this is the space within the donor framework that there is more flexibility. When you're looking at, for example, USAID and co-creation processes, this is where it comes in, where everyone has a role, but the community in the end may be the ultimate decision maker on what moves forward and who's present. Let's not gloss over who the community is as well. Who are we talking about when we say community? Who are we referring to and who represents the community? We all know that there are different segments to a given community. There's women, men, um, people who reject gender norms and are non-gender conforming, children, youth, older people, people with disabilities. There are differences, there are minorities in a given community, ethnic minorities, language minorities, differences in class, income, education as well. So who represents the community? Who can speak on behalf of the community and who should be then involved in these processes? As we think about these segments, it's important to not only consider who is closest to a given problem and who is most impacted by a given problem, but who has not traditionally been included in these conversations in the problem setting and how certain groups may have compounding experiences of oppression in these societies. Oftentimes we rely on civil society organizations and their leaders to represent the community in community-led approaches. It's important, however, to question who even these individuals are, and if they can effectively represent who is closest to the problem. It's important that they also reflect on who should really have a seat at the table from their own communities in understanding a given problem and then designing, building, and testing solutions. Let me know in the chat who you have worked with in the past in terms of representatives of local communities. Is it a civil society organization, so like a registered nonprofit organization? Is it usually a leader of this organization? Do you consider a community-led approach to be someone who's a member of your staff who is from the local community? Is it a local community association, a women's group, a youth group? Who have you worked with before? As you're having a think about that, Let's move on to the innovation piece of things. Innovation is about introducing new ideas, products, and processes that help society progress. Innovation requires creativity, problem solving, a willingness to challenge existing norms. And in the global aid and development sector, we often think of innovation as sourced from the global north, but Context is crucially important. Really what's needed for innovation to bloom is a curated space for reflection, collaboration, inclusivity, and shared ownership. So in the spirit of shifting power, I'd like to share an activist slogan from the global disability rights movement that I love and use often. Nothing about us without us. It's a saying that really embodies the community-led development movement too. Besides making sure that everyone that, that should be included is included, how can we integrate this principle in the way that we design projects and the way that we innovate? That is centering the voices of people you know to be closest to the problem, centering the voices of people who you know to be the most historically excluded, reserving judgment when you're participating in these processes as well, giving space, amplifying others, taking direction, and of course, trusting the process because innovation in the end is just as much about the process as it is about the outcome. I said previously that I'd be sharing one secret for embracing community-led problem solving and innovation, but because I'm feeling generous, I'll actually be sharing three. Secret number one, 
be curious. And that is during the process, the innovation process, whether it's using a process of human-centric design or a different methodology, a really important thing is to reserve judgment and be humble. Reserve judgment not only about ideas that are coming that you may not have considered before, you know, being open and, and asking also why, asking a lot of questions that perhaps you didn't give yourself the opportunity to ask before and allowing others to ask those same questions of you. Being curious is really important as part of this process because in a way it mimics the scientific method. It's about challenging what exists. It's about testing new things. So being curious is really important for creativity and problem solving. Let's go to the next one. Take risks. Risk taking can be scary, but it can also be really fun. This is what experimentation is all about. So again, when you're exploring problems, when you're speaking with folks, when you're unpacking existing norms and harmful behaviors, perhaps, and, and trying to change those and trying to figure out different solutions that, that may address these problems, Think about the wildest ideas that may be coming to the table and be willing to try them or sit with them for a little bit. Sometimes the wildest ideas are the best ones and it's because nobody's ever thought about them before. And practice, practice, practice. Innovation, a lot of the time, it's about approaches, it's about processes. You may not be familiar with some of these before, but the only way to learn and unlearn is to practice. When we were children, it was a time in which there was no such thing as a silly question. But as we age, this creative impulse is worn down as we are told what should and should not be. So the only way to unlock this, to unlock this kind of creativity and innovative problem solving is to practice pushing the boundaries, asking the silly questions. And it really could be the first step in changing things for the better. Okay, let's face it, these were not secrets, right? And there, there really is no secret. So it takes time to unlearn what we have spent our whole lives learning. So I just hope you have some light bulbs going off and there are some things coming up for you. I'm seeing that there's a lot of questions popping up in the chat and some comments. So that's great. And we'll get to them soon. Now let's move on to a framework. This is a framework for community-led innovation that I've put together for you taking existing tools and frameworks and packaging them in a simple way. I'm hoping that you can put this in the context of a project you may have designed recently and what you may have missed. Here we have the what, which is the problem and hypothesis components of a given project ideation phases. This includes any research that is conducted and concepting which is developed. Usually there's a theory of change that lays this out as a summary. So that's the what of it all. And at this what stage, a few questions that you might be asking yourself. Did this process involve the community? In what form? Did they decide on what the problem was? Did they decide on what the idea was? Was it community informed, shaped, driven, owned? Next, we have the how, which is the experimentation and adaptation components of a given project. This includes any piloting that was conducted and also the proposal development. Usually there's a series of adaptations and improvements made to the original pilot. And during this stage, similarly, the same questions you can ask yourself, did this process involve the community? In what form did they decide? Was it shaped by the community? Was it driven by the community? How did they participate? And finally, we have the who, which is the target community and local leadership of a given project. This includes any active partnerships and participation of the target community as primary decision makers throughout the process. And usually this takes the form if, of a power analysis and an inclusion assessment. And you can ask the same questions of yourself. How much were they involved? What segments of the community were involved? Were they the primary decision makers? What did the participation look like, et cetera? Now we're going to do an activity called a guided brainstorm. It helps you to put what you just learned into practice. 
I care about helping you apply what you learn immediately in my workshops. So let's put a five minute timer on the clock. So here's the guided brainstorm and the reflection. Thinking about these three stages, take a few minutes to reflect and think about specifically maybe a project that you were involved in designing recently or that your organization was involved in designing recently. And that includes each of these stages, the problem and ideation phase, the experimentation and adaptation phase, traditionally known as the implementation phase, and then who is involved, who's the team involved at each of these stages, and, and also who was interviewed, who was involved in the research. So I'll give you five minutes and would love to hear what you come up with. Could you play some music for us, Kenny, as, as we do that? Thank you. Thanks, Kenny. I like that alarm at the very end. <laughs> Woke me up. Anyway, thank you everyone for indulging. Hopefully that brainstorm was helpful and it gave you some time to come up with some interesting comments and questions as you reflected. If you have any of those, feel free to drop them in the chat. If there's any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box so that we don't lose them in the chat. Before we move on to the Q&A portion, I'd like to bring it all together as advertised in sharing how community-led innovation can be supported using the design sprint method. What is the design sprint method anyway? It's one of many structured approaches for participatory project design in global aid and development work. It's also my favorite. Why? It's simple. I find it very easy to use, and it's a great way to learn as you go because it's so structured. It is process driven, so there are a number of preset activities that you can do. At the same time, it's time bound. Design sprints tend to last between four to six days on average, so you can adapt it to whatever uh, works best for you. In that way, it's fast and it very much prioritizes the doing and building over the talking and writing. Because if we think about it, that's also a global north, western dominant approach to creation. Instead of writing, you're out there, you're talking to folks, you are building things as well, you're concepting in a way and in real time. So it's adaptable to any cultural or geographic context. It can be done in person or it can be done virtually. And it's fun. It's infused with creativity and experimentation. And the steps here are on the slide. The first step is map, which includes interviewing your target community members to understand a specific problem or challenge, as well as mapping the journey that this person experiences as well as their pain points. So really spending the day, if we're assuming this is a, a five-day design sprint, day one is mapping. It's really all about discovery. It's about research. It's about empathy and sitting with the community members who are closest to this problem. So ideally, you have community members that are part of the design team that are doing these interviews as well and making decisions related to this but are included from the start. And day two is sketch. So that means brainstorming after you've had time to sit with the community and the problem at hand and observing and making notes, sitting with that, brainstorming as many solutions as you possibly can to address the identified problem. Again, this speaks to the importance of having community members in the room and community members leading this process is the ideation part of it. So sketching out, drawing, or outlining, if you must, you know, the writing, some potential solutions that may be winning ideas. The key here is about being curious. It's about taking risks, like we talked about, and practicing. So this is maybe a new thing to many of you, but it's really a great way to get out of the day-to-day -day and the way that we do things in the global aid and development sector. So ideating, sketching out potential solutions. Day three is decision day, and who decides? The community, right? So community-led innovation using this method. There is ultimately a decider. Everyone has a say in this at this time. Everyone's voice should be heard. 
But in the end, the group and the people that decide are the community members. At this point, and on this day, you present the sketches and the ideas, the initial concepts, and decide on the idea that best addresses the identified problem for the target community members. Day four is prototyping. It is building the first draft of your project idea. And this is not a written draft necessarily. If it is a product, it should be something physical, something tangible, something that you can hold. It really doesn't need to look pretty. It's just something that can give the touch and the feel of something that you're trying to produce. Or if it's a process, it's something that you can potentially even act out. So how would this work in reality, right? And giving a chance to feel, have it sit in your body, how it would be working. So again, if it's a tangible product, you make a dummy version and anticipate all the key features that you might have, such as if it's a mobile app or a life jacket even, which was something that was produced in a community-led innovation program that I saw a case study for. If it's an intangible service, act it out, feel how it might work in context. And if it's a hybrid, make sure to do both. And finally, the test, the day of testing, which is day five. So test the validity of your prototypes during interviews with your target community members. So this is when you, not only your community members who are on the design team with you, but you can go out and meet them where they are and ask them to take a look at your prototype. If it's a product, you know, and, you know, talking it through what it's supposed to be, what it's supposed to mean. If it's a process, what is it supposed to be? Demonstrating it and getting really clear opinions and honest opinions about whether or not it's something that they would be interested in. Seek feedback about whether it actually addresses the original problem and what features can be eliminated, added, or improved. And then, of course, you adapt and repeat this entire process. You can go back. If it's really not on the mark, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Maybe you go back to your ideas, your sketching, make another decision. Or maybe if it is addressing the problem somewhat, but not particularly in the right way, you can go back to the prototyping stage and adapt. So I'm really curious, have you ever used the design sprint method before or something similar? Let me know in the chat. And what do you think about this approach? It would be great to know. Putting this a little bit in context. So over the top, you can see the design sprint method, which are those five phases or those five days, map, sketching, deciding, prototyping, and testing. What we also have built into this framework is the what, the how, and the who. This is the activity that you did, the guided brainstorm, and we're bringing it all together here. The what stage, a lot of the time, overlaps with the mapping and sketching phases. That's the problem and understanding the problem, sitting with your communities, involving your communities in designing, making sure that you're designing the right things, making that decision at the center in day three, and having that decider be the community, and then moving on to the how, which is making sure that you're designing the thing, the product or the process in the right way, that you're designing things right. That is the prototyping and the testing stages. And of course, throughout, as I mentioned, who is involved from the design team itself, if that it's designed by and for the right people, which is the community, and that it is built and tested by the right people as well, which is the community and the people that are most proximate to the problem is very important throughout this entire process. What questions are coming up for you? It, what still feels confusing or challenging? Please drop your questions in the Q&A box and, and let us know. And in the meantime, as you're doing that, I may read out a couple of comments that have come through. Kate mentions looking back at a program that she had for humanitarian actors, the large displaced population in Northeast Nigeria. The program was community informed. Communities were consulted in the design phase, but unfortunately were not engaged as co-designers. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful 
observation and something I've seen a lot as well. So a lot of the time, we, the language that we use is, is really important, right? Consultation is not the same as co-designing or co-creating. Uh, Brian mentions, I wish we had enough time to, to always do this. Yes, so the time thing is, I think, really important. This can be done quickly or it can take a lot of time, right? right? That depends on a number of things. It depends on where you are in the product design process to begin with. If you're still at the, the bidding stage, the donor has announced a certain program that they're willing to fund and has set some priorities. The timing is actually really important. That was one of the myths that it can be done at any point in time during you know, an existing uh, project. So even if it's not done at the very beginning, it, you know, these principles and some of these steps can be used in the middle of a program, even when it started to run. It can be adapted, it can be adjusted, and all of that sort of thing. Kate mentions the helpful way to structure, but loosely, the process in a way that encourages creative collaboration. Great. McLean mentions my organization's HCD methodology follows the same framework. Great. And has been a really wonderful addition to our community-led design work. That's really great to hear that it's working in action and that you can vouch for it. Uh, Bernarda mentions, I noticed I have used something similar, maybe not as fast as a five-day process, but a process that allows us to bring something new and useful for the organization. Absolutely. And I think that goes back to Brian's point about time frame. So I can share an example of the way in which I've used this in the global aid development peace building sectors. So I worked on a project with USAID funded project through FHI 360 as a human centered design consultant and a facilitator in which we effectively ran a hackathon and a series of design sprints for one of their projects called the Networks for Peace project. This was a regional program over three countries, Myanmar, Thailand, and Sri Lanka, in which they were trying to address harmful hate speech and promote positive narratives around um, social cohesion and peace building in these countries. And so we did a series of virtual design sprints in which we brought together people from across these countries, civil society organizations, and we went through this design sprint model. So it was a sub-grants program that was funded by USAID in which we were able to do this. And we did so over the course of two weeks. So we expanded this design sprint process out. It was 100% virtual. Uh, we used a Miro board template, which I will share with you. I, I think it's a great way to do this sort of thing. There's questions coming up. Kate asks, speaking of time, do you find that donors are increasingly open to building in time to consult multiple communities? Usually the teams I am on are working across different regions at the design phase. Yeah, so I think maybe what I just mentioned addresses that a little bit. In terms of USAID specifically, they really prefer to start the process as early as possible and to get buy-in also from the donor because there is that conversation that needs to be ongoing at the same time. Your stakeholders, assuming if you are working for an international NGO or some kind of intermediary implementing partner and working with the local or civil society organizations that you also need to get buy-in across the board. This also takes time away from civil society organizations, from the people participating in the process who may be doing so on a volunteer basis. It requires a lot of coordination up front, but once you get it started, it can go quite quickly and it condenses the project design process considerably. So it's not only participatory, but it could potentially move very fast. We have another question here that is, have you ever run into challenges with how to give equal weight to different communities in terms of engaging in the process, even if some are smaller or face different challenges than others? The way that I'm understanding this question is about different community segments so community groups that as a whole represent a community because say you have women, say you have teenage girls, men, working professionals, different groups of folks who may have different interests or different perspectives when it comes to certain problems that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So I think part of that is really important to have a skilled facilitator and to discuss this before. It's the preparatory work, the preparation that you do in advance and making sure that you do a power analysis and an inclusion assessment at the forefront so that you're keeping in mind the various power dynamics of each group and each person that is showing up in that space. I think we're going to move to close because I don't see any other questions coming through, but I really appreciate your time. Before we close, I have a question for you. Did you have an aha moment? In other words, what part of this workshop did you find the most helpful? What are your key takeaways? If you can share in the chat, I can read those responses out loud. And if you liked this workshop and are eager for more, I'll share those details in just a moment. Here is a snapshot of the Miro board template, which I promised you. So this is one of many Miro board templates that exist out there. And I'll be sure to share a link to this via email. So please look out for that. Also, as a thank you for, for attending, I'm also including a special discount to the Shifting Power Accelerator in which we will have a dedicated workshop on this topic as well, but we'll go deeper and we'll actually apply it to one of your projects as well. So that's the promo code COMMUNITY10 in which you get 10% off. And finally, stay in touch. I hope you found this helpful. If you still have questions, I'm more than happy to chat. We can get on a call. We can exchange some emails. I have a link tree, which is at we Be Fearless, And you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Thanks again for joining, whether you're here with me live or watching the recording. I hope you have a great rest of your evening, day, afternoon. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. Take care.